Energy in America, something we have to watch all the time. Maybe we don't pay enough attention to it. It's part of our economy. It's part of our global economy. And uh, every couple of weeks, we have a show with EPRINC, Energy Policy Research Organization in Washington, a think tank that does energy globally. Uh, and uh, today, we have Max Pizier. He's an energy research market analyst at uh, EPRINC. Hi, hi, Max. Welcome to the show. Uh, greetings, Jay. Greetings to everyone there. Thank you again for having me. Absolutely. So we, we, uh, we want to talk today about the uh, effect of the uh, U.S.-Iran um, tensions on world prices in oil and other energy you know, resources. Um, that's complicated, isn't it? Uh, but, you know, and, and it seems to me like at first, you know, if, if most of the oil in the world goes through the Strait of Hormuz then, uh, and there are tensions there, uh, that would affect the price of oil. But it's not clear that exactly what has happened. Uh, so can you tell That's us true. where we are in terms of Hormuz and oil and global economy? Well, on, on any given day, uh, about 20% of crude oil uh, that's used in the world that's produced uh, moves through the Straits of Hormuz. Uh, the Straits of Hormuz are bound, uh, uh, the countries of Oman and Iran are, are the two critical countries that come closest to the Straits. Um, if this was the 1970s and these this uh, uh, geopolitical tensions that have been escalating between the Trump administration and Iran, um, you, you would have panic all over the world. Uh, that's what you were having back in the 1970s. For, for clear reasons these days, despite all the political tensions that we have, the geopolitical conflicts, not only in Iran, but also in Venezuela, uh, in Libya, uh, those things are muted by other factors that are uh, taking place in the world. Um, so that's even the payload despite for this show. So, boys and girls, what Max tells us now is really important to understand exactly how these, uh, these uh, areas of tension are affecting oil prices and thus the global economy. I'm sitting on the edge of my chair, Max. Well, uh, thank you. I mean, there is, there is a considerable amount of drama. What's going on in Iran? What's going on in Libya? What's uh, going on in Venezuela? Those are true crises. People are... Um, Innocent lives are being uh, uh, affected by these things. But because despite these, these um, bullish indicators for, for uh, crude oil prices, we in the United States since uh, 2008 have had a surge in, in production. And that has offset considerably uh, the threats, that, that uh, the potential threats that we have from places like uh, what's taking place in Iraq, what's taking place in Venezuela, and what's taking place um, uh, what other country? Libya, thank you. Uh, so this, this technological, these technological innovations that we've had uh, put in place over the last 10 years here in the United States have effectively offset the threats that, that could arise and that have proven to arisen in the past uh, that could arise uh, if, if we haven't had this surge in production uh, in the last we intend uh, 10, this, Max? 15 years. Have we taken affirmative we steps to, to avoid, uh, you know, uh, an effect of, of these crises? Uh, I, I think it's an unintended consequence. Uh, the, it's the, the, the fact that we have uh, the, the, the geopolitical ramifications of, of U.S. Uh, surging crude oil productions I don't think they were um, clearly factored in by any major policy maker. The, uh, certain people were um, did take note of it. They 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 realized that uh, uh, this this control that that exists in um, the Middle East countries, the OPEC, uh, the oil producing countries in the Middle East, um, that that control has dissipated, uh, has been muted. But um, no major policymaker, I think, has really come out and said that the geopolitical threat in particular has been, uh, uh, I wouldn't say extinguished, but uh, pulled back considerably. So what, what you're describing is a kind of uh, um, a leveling of the playing field, a leveling of the market where uh, the source of the, the, uh, the resources are coming from different places. 
more places. Exactly. So a, it's diffused right, now, see, where 10 years ago it was all about the Middle East. You must be reading my mind because those are those are the words that I would have just would have used just now. Uh, diffused. You have uh, uh, rather than having a centralization, you have uh, diffusion. Uh, you have uh, multifarious. You know, to, to try a twenty-five dollar word. Uh, uh, set up of, of, of producing centers throughout the world, not just localized in one particular region. And that has made an impact uh, geopolitically that we can withstand these kinds of tensions that we have in the Western Hemisphere, uh, Lib uh, Venezuela in particular, in Africa, Libya, in the Middle East, uh, uh, between the United States and Iran, or more between the Trump administration and Iran, uh, mm. put it that way. <laughs> So that leaves us with two directions to inquire about. Um, the first direction is um, that, that somehow, and I, I'm not confident this will happen, somehow the, the tension in, uh, between the United States and Iran will, uh, will, will alleviate. <clears throat> that uh, whatever the Washington's foreign policy is, if you, if you can say Washington has a foreign policy, not clear to me. Uh, in fact, not clear to a lot of people. Uh, but it, right. somehow, well, I think that that's the that's that's the attribute of the Trump administration. You don't know what's going to happen next. I mean, you, you had um, an escalating situation. You had a drone shot down. Uh, you had harsh words on the part of the, the president. Then uh, uh, they were muted right away and then they were escalated again and then withdrawn again. So who knows which way? I mean, it's 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 you've gone past the point of risk where you could quantify things. You're now at the point of uncertainty. You just don't know what's going to happen. Well, you know, that's so, <laughs> it's so interesting because I think the same process exists in the stock market. <clears throat> if, you have, if you have a situation where nobody can anticipate what Washington, what Trump is going to do from day to day, where nobody can anticipate whether the tensions will be up or down or sideways on a given day, then I think people, don't you agree, Max? There's a fatigue factor. I know I'm fatigued. I can't follow it anymore. <laughs> I don't know which way it's going, I, I, so I kind of give up. You know? Well, I, I'm with you there. I, you know, there's certainly a fatigue factor. I mean, you're, you're seeing this uh, as it's been reported in today's uh, Wall Street Journal. Consumer confidence is slipping. You, you don't know which way the, tr uh, the conflicts in trade, say, with Mexico and Canada and China are going to go. Uh, again, in the Wall Street Journal, the FedEx, re uh, there was a report on Federal Express how Federal Express being an intermediary of globalization, moving goods between not just within the United States, but uh, across continents, um, they're, they're seriously affected by, by this disruption, not knowing what to expect, um, not when will the, uh, uh, the trade discussions uh, will end, but if the trade discussions will end. So mm -hmm. that right there is uh, uh, moving from, if you knew when, then you can quantify something. If you don't know when then you have just uncertainty and and you withdraw uh and and just wait on the sidelines and that's what's mm -hmm. taking place that's the other uh set of uh factors that's uh uh facilitating the uh, the drop in oil prices is that you have this uncertainty you have slowing job growth you have uh the trade conflicts which are escalating and there's no clear uh understanding of of when these things might end but you and, know uh, I mean, you those know. things you suggest that there's a linkage ahead. between oil prices, and I really want to understand this. <clears throat> These days, this is, there's a linkage between oil prices and the global economy. So if oil, oil prices are going down, it's a reflection of a, a decline in the global economy. Oil prices are going up, it's a, it's a reflection of, a, of an improvement in, in the global. Am I right about that? Where, where do you stand on no, that? There's, there's I mean, yeah, I, I, as we were discussing beforehand, uh, before we went on the air, it's a two-factor problem. Two, uh, the first thing is you have a surge in oil production in the United States, uh, in North America, Canada also, but mostly the United States. And that's a muting factor on higher oil prices. But then uh, the second component is all of this uncertainty that comes, economic uncertainty that comes uh, from the trade conflicts from uh, dropping consumer confidence, sl uh, slowing job growth. So it's twofold. It's not just one thing. It's, uh, you know, it, that, that, that's the way I would reply to, to the question that you uh, mm -hmm. presented there. But these factors you just described, 
uh, actually suggests a slowing of global economy anyway, right? Right, exactly. I mean, because of the trade conflicts, uh, you you have uh, you have uh, U.S. Steel shutting down the plants that it reopened in in Granite City, Illinois, because uh, demand for steel has been muted. No longer do you have a, a certainty or the knowledge uh, that, that there will be not just domestic demand for the steel that you produce, but uh, say uh, demand in Mexico, Canada, or or China, and vice versa. Uh, and and yeah, th there are numerous examples like that. Mm -hmm. That's that's. Uh, that's the, that's the point that's uh, well, that's me, that's the second set of factors that that pulls back uh, that that affects uh, crude oil prices and pulls yeah. them back. Now let me, let me you know try to make it a, a sort of a pure inquiry here and say, on the one side, um, hypothetically, the administration uh, would would change its unpredictable uh, conduct. Um, and it, it would become predictable and it would become positive and it would be able to cut, a, you know, a moderate, a moderated deal with Iran mm -hmm. and thus diminish the crisis, um, you know, in the Gulf of uh, rather the Straits of Hormuz. Uh, let's assume that for a moment. Let's assume that all is 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 light and goodness uh, in that area of the world. And there's no longer a crisis between the U.S. and Iran. What happens to oil prices? Well, then I, uh, my suspicion is that they would uh, continue to slide. Uh, you you have OPEC trying to control the supply component, but e even if uh, marital bliss broke out in the Straits of Hormuz, <laughs> with, uh, Iran, you still have all of the other the other component, which is uh, uh, trade conflicts with China, Mexico, Canada. The critical ones; those are the critical ones, and uh, still uncertainty in Europe with Brexit. So you know, not just marital bliss in, in the Straits of Hormuz, but also uh, if we could just uh, temper what's going on, uh, what, 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 uh, the provocations on the part of the Trump administration with Mexico, uh, the provocations against China. If, if there was some some settlement to those those issues, that's that's when you would see. An uptick on the on the economic side, mm -hmm. uh, and then maybe you would see uh, uh, so a stabilization. Maybe not 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 uh, an increase, but a stabilization in uh, the the drop in oil prices. Well, I, I, th I, I think mean, it's th obviously. Th Please go ahead. I think a, a stabilization of these um, of these unpredictable uh, you know moves by the administration would have um, a huge effect in. And not only in oil, but in geopolitical relations uh, and in the economies of uh, so many countries around the world, simply by virtue of, as you put it before, uh, confidence, confidence in general that we're going to be OK here. Um, right. So it, all the, it seems to me that all those things touch each other, the, the consumer Absolutely. confidence, the jobs, the economies and the oil prices. Right. But right. if, I, if, uh, I, if I told you, Max, just hypothetically now, that that's not going to happen. In my heart, I believe this is probably the reality. Um, it's not going to happen. And in fact, it's the tit for tat thing that's going on between the United States and, uh, and Tehran. Uh, it's going to get mm -hmm. worse. If I, if I tell you that it's going to wind up, um, you know, in a, a, my own theory, a battle of, uh, of cyber war. Because... Because that's what uh, Trump has started, a battle of cyber war, where, where grids come down in various places in the world. And cities are, you know, dysfunctional. The cities stop functioning and people die because of the lack of electricity and, and so forth. If I, uh, if I tell you that, if I tell you we're going to get into a, we're going to get into it with Iran in the next few weeks, hypothetically, uh, then I would ask you, how will that affect oil prices and all those, all those other factors, you know, considered? Don't answer yet, Max, because we're going to take a short break. But I think everybody is going to be listening when we come back. They're going to want to know your answer. That's Max okay. <laughs> of ePrink in Washington, D.C., an energy research market specialist. We'll be right back and we'll, we'll get his answer to that question. What a, what a cliffhanger, eh? 
Right, right, absolutely, absolutely. Um, I want to know what I'm going to say, too. <laughs> we'll be right back. <laughs> Aloha, I'm Dennis Wong, a host here at Think Tech Hawaii, a digital media company serving the people of Hawaii. We provide a video platform for citizen journalists to raise public awareness in Hawaii. We are a Hawaii nonprofit that depends on the generosity of its supporters to keep on going. We'd be grateful if you'd go to thinktechhawaii.com and make a donation to support us now. Thanks so much. <laughs> Aloha, I'm Jane Sugimura, host here at Think Tech Hawaii, a digital media company serving the people of Hawaii. We provide a video platform for citizen journalists to raise public awareness in Hawaii. We are a Hawaii nonprofit that depends on the generosity of its supporters to keep on going. We'd be grateful if you go to thinktechhawaii.com and make a donation to support us now. Thank you so much. Oh, I could hardly wait for the end of that break. So, um, Max, have you thought about it? Is, is there an answer? Maybe it's unanswerable. Well, no, I've, I've thought about it. Thank you for the challenge. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I don't see a dystopian situation to the, degree that, uh, to the one that you portray. I think cyber threats are serious. Um, uh, thankfully, uh, the institutional structure of the United States is such that we have the Department of Homeland Security, we have the National Security Agency, and uh, they, of the, uh, on the cyber front, they, and especially the, uh, the infrastructure, things uh, uh, such as power plants and related uh, uh, components, they thankfully um, are, they're robust. They can certainly be straightened, but uh, given the research that I've done, um, it would take a long time to bring uh, bring down the grid of the United States. I mean, it's certainly uh, the th the threats are there, uh, but uh, because because of the institutional infrastructure, uh, department of, that that is run by the Department of Homeland Security, among other things, it'll be a while before a country like Iran or say North Korea or uh, China could begin doing the kind of damage that you describe. It. And then the second part of the question was. If this dystopian nightmare actually comes true, what will it do for uh, uh, petroleum product demand? Well, obviously it's going to, going to collapse, but uh, we're not there yet, and I think we're we're a considerable distance from that. Oh, good. Well, that's that's comforting. Uh, I, I hope like, yes. <laughs> I hope I've offered you some comfort there. Just remember, this, this is on video, Max. <laughs> <laughs> So, right, absolutely. <clears throat> you know, you talk about uh, you know the change in circumstances, the diffused sources of uh, energy we're getting these days. Um, I'd like to dig into that a little bit. So right now, as opposed to ten years ago, the United States is in better shape because it, it controls maybe to a larger extent where it is getting energy. Uh, it has LNG. Maybe it's getting oil uh, within its boundaries or nearby. Um, and it's, uh, you know, it's getting renewable energy as well. I'm a little troubled, and I hope you factor this into your answer. I'm a little mm -hmm. troubled by the administration's change last week from the Obama clean energy, renewable energy policy to a policy focused on coal. Uh, where that seemed to me to be, uh, you know, going backward. I don't know if it'll have any effect, but that's, that's what he said. And so the question is, where, where are we in terms of our Call it diffused energy resources. Uh, where are we? Uh, I I think coal is being very strongly challenged by low price natural gas uh, in stationary uh, uses. Stationary is categorized uh, electricity generation, uh, industrial usage uh, such as paper mills, refineries, uh, cement production, and uh, and home use. Uh, home and commercial use, heating buildings, heating water, things of that nature. So um, the new renewables in the category of solar and, uh, and wind, they're attractive to certain constituencies, but uh, as 
actually being effective uh, and, and, and providing baseload electricity, for example, um, I, I'm, I'm not as optimistic uh, for that to be a resource as, as perhaps some environmental constituencies. Uh, the wind doesn't blow all the time. The sun doesn't always shine. Um, and then the, these installed bases, uh, just to give you a, an example, a nuclear power plant that is sited on 400 or 500 acres, to generate that same amount of electricity from a wind farm, you're going to need 170,000 acres. Oh, wow. Of, right. So uh, right away you can see the scale difference. Where, whereas the nuclear power plant can run the whole time, um, a wind farm on, situated on 170,000 acres can only run as long as the wind is blowing. Uh, and you have to site the uh, uh, the turbines in such a way that they don't take energy away from each other. They continually, they, if you put one propeller close to another one, it pulls energy away from another retrieving mechanism. It's it's the physics of it is, in, it can be intuitively explained, but it's it's not easily explained. But so so consequently, the, the siding is is huge. So to somehow think that uh, wind and solar energy is imminent, uh, people really haven't factored in the land usage consequences. Mm. Uh, in the way have that you, I described to you just now. Have you heard? Have you heard of this case pending in the federal district court in um, I think it's Eugene, Oregon, called the Juli Juliana case? It was on 60 Minutes a few days ago, um, and it's mm -hmm. a case by 21 young people who claim um, that, um, that the right to a uh, safe climate, a climate free of climate change, is an inalienable right under the Constitution. It's a constitutional right. When the Constitution says uh, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, whatever right. it says, that that includes action by the government uh, you know, to, 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 to deal with climate change, to preserve the environment for generations to come. And this has actually gotten by a number of motions to dismiss that the Trump administration has filed in order to stop the suit. So the suit, the suit according to the 60 Minutes piece, is still alive. It's very interesting because it would change all of constitutional law. It would certainly change all of the law around climate change. But assume with me for a moment that if that okay. suit or some other suit or the, the will of the electorate coming, coming soon in 2020 <coughs> requires the government to take affirmative and Herculean steps to deal with climate change. Okay? And that would include, you know, whether it's economically efficient or not, that would include spending tons of money on renewables. How is that going to affect the energy mix in this country? I know there's a lot of speculation around that question, but how would that affect your answer that you, know, you were talking about before? Um, that, that sort of changes the mix, doesn't it? Well, yes. I mean, it's, it's, it's uh, what you're describing, I think, is uh, jurisdiction chopping, where you, you try and find a, uh, a court that um, will favorably rule on uh, give you a favorable judgment on, on, uh, on, on a particular case, especially in an environmental one. Um, something like that has already happened. Um, we have, uh, the best example that I know of uh, is something that is known as uh, 2007 uh, uh, Massachusetts versus EPA, which went to the Supreme Court. One of the things that's uh, been problematic for environmentalists is getting legislative, uh, at the, legislation at the national level uh, that proclaims that uh, greenhouse gases are a some sort of a threat. So that particular uh, court action, uh, Massachusetts versus CPA, as it was ruled in 2007, uh, it was close decision, four to three. Um, Justice Stevens wrote the majority opinion, and he was the one who, in in the opinion, said that carbon dioxide is 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 uh, is a pollutant. That judgment, that ruling, uh, effectively empowered the EPA to begin regulating uh, greenhouse gas emissions at the national level. So we had all sorts of legislation that came out of that. Mm -hmm. um, 
So I, the, the case that you described in the state of Oregon is, isn't the first one. I mean, it's the first one that I hear of uh, that there's an inalienable right provision. But as far as uh, legis uh, court decisions that have been made uh, with respect to the environment, uh, with re uh, the the 2007 one uh, is is one of the it's it's the clearest one that I know of where mm -hmm. uh, judicial intervention um, has has affected has has uh, categorically affected. Um, uh, the implementation of national policies. Well, Max, Without assume, that decision, please go ahead. Assume with me that this case, and this was, it's a long shot, we have to agree. Um, this case and other cases, and maybe even, maybe even congressional action, uh, finally um, accepts and adopts and acts on the notion that climate change uh, is a serious problem affecting humanity. Uh, that climate change is correctable if you take affirmative action and you stop, you know, generating emissions and stop using fossil fuel. And that, and that, mm -hmm. and these courts, or maybe Congress itself under, you know, after a new election, I don't know, um, decides to take affirmative steps to stop the use of coal, to stop the use of fossil fuel, and to say to us, the American people and, and American business, you can't use fossil fuel anymore. Cannot do it. You have to find another way, even if it costs you more money, even if it's not economically efficient. Okay? Suppose that happens. It's a logical possibility, although right now I, I wouldn't put any money on it. Um, <laughs> suppose, suppose that happens. Well, I mean, if the odds are good, there's always a good bet out there. But, you know, most likely the bookie's uh, working against you. But that's a whole <laughs> exactly. different problem. <laughs> if that happens, and it seems to me that nobody in this country, I mean, by law, would be able to use fossil fuel, like, like gasoline. I, I don't know how it would come down on LNG, probably badly. Um, so what happens right. to, to our energy mix then? And what happens to the price of oil? And if oil you know, declines around the world, uh, what happens to the world economy if this country, just this country, decides that climate change is important and, and rules out any fossil fuels? Well, it, it's, you know, again, you're going with these dystopian uh, scenarios. Uh, the first one was with the, uh, uh, the major uh, cyber takedown of, of the U.S. Uh, power grid. You know, the same thing here. I, I, I can't envision uh, a world without uh, fossil fuel usage um, because it, it's, its ramifications. It's not just energy production. It's, it's also... Um, uh, the whole petrochemical complex and and how from containers to to building materials to medicines um, all these things are infused with uh, and 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 run on on the foundation of, of fossil fuel production um, so it's 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 a scenario that that's just really difficult to contemplate obviously um, Creative legislators are there. Uh, they, they certainly, if, in, in the same way that the Supreme Court decision that I described uh, came about, um, and the le ensuing legislation that came from that, uh, entrepreneurial legislators exist all over the place. Uh, somebody can uh, put together a deal, find the votes, and uh, produce this, this, this sort of thing. My hope is, is that uh, through judicial intervention and stalling, <laughs> you've... You, you put this, this sort of scenario that you've described to me uh, off as far off as, as possible into the future. Um, I, I just don't see, I, I, you know, there, there would have to be a, there would be a significant trade-off in terms of uh, what we could do uh, uh, as a society and a civilization. I, I envy you, Max, because you're right there watching it and seeing if these <laughs> dystopian things could ever come true. And, uh, you know, seeing, seeing those charts and graphs come and go. It's really interesting. You you live in interesting times. Actually, we all live in interesting so times. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. <laughs> Thanks, Max um, Bizier, uh, a market researcher in energy thank you, and, Jay. Uh, in Eprink in Washington. Thank you so much, Max. Aloha till the next Likewise, time. Thank you very much. Aloha. Yes, thank you.